To old-time fight fans, bodybuilder Lou Ferrigno looked like a clone of Abe Simon, a monster-sized heavyweight from the 1930s. Simon stood over 6 feet 4 inches tall and weighed over 255 pounds. He was a normal-sized child until the age of 13 when he experienced a growth spurt that left him too large to play with kids his own age, and even older boys would have nothing to do with him because he was a very big and strong kid. Simon played football for John Adams High School when he broke the leg of an opposing player. Former heavyweight champion Gene Tunney sought out Simon after one of the games. He asked Simon if he wanted to box and the young man immediately said yes, getting into a left-handed fighting stance. You're a southpaw? Tunney asked. Simon said yes. Not too bad, Tunney murmured, but we'll fix that. Tunney enlisted the aid of millionaire businessman Jock Whitney and the two invested a small fortune into Simon, both into his ring development and his marketing. Tunney would leave for the West Coast and leave Simon in the hands of trainer Jimmy Bronson. But when Tunney returned to check on things, he found out that Simon had not obeyed instructions and remained a southpaw. Whitney also complained that it was costing more to feed Simon than one of his racehorses. The huge heavyweight gorged himself on baskets of clams, mountainous salads, pots of coffee, and three-inch thick steaks. Tunney and Whitney then dropped Simon like a hot potato. The newspapers were running a weekly story on the muscular heavyweight, and this immediately stopped without the sponsorship of his benefactors. The 19-year-old heavyweight who once enjoyed steak and pork chops for breakfast every morning now had to fight for his food under new manager Jimmy Johnston and trainer Freddie Brown. But Johnston's guidance was shrewd. Simon would win his first 13 fights before losing to a fellow undefeated in Lou Nova. He would win his next three fights before losing a slugfest with the more experienced Buddy Bear being stopped on his feet. Simon would be hot and cold over the next three years, losing to Al Bray, Lem Franklin, splitting a pair with Willie Reddish before scoring his biggest victory to date against Jersey Joe Walcott in 1940. The clever Walcott gave Simon a boxing lesson for five rounds until Simon crashed a right cross to his mouth and knocked the future heavyweight champion of the world out cold. The win put Simon on the radar, and on March 21, 1941, Simon would get his shot at Joe Lewis and about scheduled for 20 rounds. Reporters scoffed, claiming that Simon wouldn't last 30 seconds despite outweighing the champion by 52 pounds. But the clever Jimmy Johnston enlisted the aid of former heavyweight champion Jack Johnson to help train Simon. Jack Johnson was a long-standing critic of Joe Lewis and boasted that he would teach Simon how to beat him. His words helped promote the bout. Simon suffered a chipped bone in his right thumb in training, but this forced him to change from being a slugger to a boxer. The strategy worked against Lewis, as after Simon was knocked down in the opening round, he successfully used his jab to keep Lewis at bay. Finally, in the 13th, Lewis slipped past Simon's jab and floored the gargantuan heavyweight twice before the referee called a halt. Simon gained respect in defeat. One boxing reporter described him as a huge hairy mole that kept boring in on Lewis. Lewis himself would confess that he never suffered such a pummeling from any man, even in his loss to Max Schmeling. NBC boxing commentator Sam Taub said, Simon's the best material to come up against Lewis since Joe won the crown. A little more finesse, and he may make the grade. It's my guess he'll be the future heavyweight champion. Simon would later join the National Guard, but his fingers were so large that it was impossible for him to get them inside the trigger of a gun, so they made him a color sergeant. He would later seek work as a policeman in Long Beach, New York, but had the same problem with their revolvers. He was then assigned to be a traffic officer. One reporter wrote that Simon's hands were like bunches of bananas, and athletic commissioners had trouble finding boxing gloves big enough to fit him. It would take a year, but Johnston would once again maneuver Simon into another title shot, this time facing Lewis in Madison Square Garden. Lewis was now a buck private in the army, 
and his earnings would go to the Army Emergency Relief Fund, an organization set up to provide care for military families. Lewis predicted a third round knockout, but he would be without his longtime trainer, Jack Blackburn, who was forced to listen to the bout on the radio from his hospital bed as he battled pneumonia. Simon argued with the referee, claiming that he had risen from the canvas before the referee reached the count of ten. Reporters were cruel to Simon after the bout, stating that he was a born sailor because he was so good at hitting the deck, and that he must have thought every soldier was a general because all he could see were stars. Another reporter described him as a muscular Boris Karloff with a heart bigger than his body. Simon would receive over $13,000 for his troubles. Simon would marry Rita Seibel and start a family. He would sign to face Harry Bobo after the Lewis fight, but then announced his retirement right before the bout. Simon complained of a lame foot, head pains, and his wife persuaded him to retire from the ring. He would work multiple jobs after his retirement. He was able to get into acting because of his intimidating appearance playing a thug in On the Waterfront and several teleplays of the time period such as Requiem for a Heavyweight. He also worked as a boxing referee in the New York area and would return to law enforcement. Eventually his arthritis would worsen and he would go into public relations for the Roosevelt Raceway, a venue for harness racing. Simon would die suddenly of a heart attack in October of 1969. He was 56 years old. By all accounts, he was a pleasant and soft-spoken man outside the ring. He was a battleship without guns, one reporter said. Too nice and intelligent a guy to get punched in the head. <laughs> 